Morning everyone, welcome to Online Church with Grace and Truth. Uh, my name is Deborah, and it's wonderful to share this morning with you once again. Uh, we've been looking a lot about sin, uh, the consequences, the curse of sin, uh, but how we are alive in Christ. Uh, we've also been looking at the assurance of the Holy Spirit. Today, uh, as we wrap up this series in Romans, uh, we're coming towards the end of Romans 8, uh, we'll be looking at something that wraps all of that up together, and that is God's love. Uh, before we do that, uh, let's quieten down our hearts uh, to praise and worship our Lord together through song. down in the valleys you made a way for us it was dark 
The storm was raging, but you led us out of the storm. Your light shine upon us. Oh God, how many times have we gone through this since we have come to know you, Lord? And Lord, I'm so grateful. We are so grateful in our hearts that you came to us. You came to me when I was afflicted. You came to me when I was helpless and hopeless. Lord, how many of your children delight in you because you came to them even in their need. In their desperation, you heard their cry. You heard their heart cry out to you. Oh Lord, save me. Lord, do not take me beyond what I can bear. Lord, I'm in such great pain. Lord, is there hope for me? But God, hallelujah, hallelujah and hallelujah. For the word of God, even as heaven and earth shall fade, your word will surely remain. Because you are God and your word is truth. It is yes and amen. Your promises are true. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. Because, oh God, you are our everlasting Father. You have made us, formed us. You know our strength. You know our weakness. You have given us gift. And today I feel the joy with my brothers and my sisters. Hallelujah. That you can bring us together to worship you in spirit and in truth. To worship you with a joy, the unspeakable joy that you have given to us by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. The joy that only you can give in times of darkness, in times of despair. Lord, you let us into the garden. Just as Adam and Eve, long time ago, before sin came, the Father walked with his children. You love your children so much. You love your sons and daughters so much. Is there anything too difficult for you? Is there a disease that you cannot heal? You are God. You made us. So Lord, we trust in you. Because the word of God says, God is good. God is good all the time. God is good. In our mountains, in our valleys, God is good. Hallelujah. Lord, we just thank you. Thank you that you came to us and you brought us into thy saving light. You took us out of darkness and you stood us in your marvelous light. We worship you, Lord. We know you delight in your children's worship. And we ask, Lord, that your spirit just give us that freedom, that liberty in you to worship our Lord, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, your name is above all name. Your name is like honey on our lips. You are everything, oh God. And we have tasted the sweetness, the purity of your love. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. If anyone out there is in despair, even if you are blind and there's darkness around you, God, Jesus, he is light. He will shine his light upon you. Even if physically you see darkness, the light of God, the light of Jesus Christ, because he's the light of the world, the light of Jesus Christ, you will see. The spiritual eyes will be open. Just focus upon Jesus, upon Jesus and Jesus alone. He died on the cross. He suffered a death that no one could ever fathom because he loved us so much. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. 
we give you praise, all the honor, all the glory. You are our God. You are our everlasting, loving Father. Amen. Amen. Hope you enjoyed our music worship just then. Uh, did you know that you can be a part of our music team as well? Uh, all you have to do is record yourself or film yourself singing whilst uh, we are singing uh, music worship together. Or if you're a musician, you can also film and record yourself likewise. Um, our editing team can then just take your video or, uh, or your recording and then add it to our music video. And how exciting would it be if we can all be a part of that? We might not be able to meet up physically together to sing together, uh, but this might be a, an interesting and exciting way that we can uh, kind of uh, digitally uh, sing and worship our Lord God together. Uh, if you don't feel like you have uh, an amazing uh, singing voice, don't let that put you off. Uh, we really believe that our Lord God delights when his people are together worshiping him and we would love to hear your voice i'll see you singing uh, together with us next week uh, if this sounds like something you might be interested in send us an email or send your clip to the email just below we'd love to hear from you Hi everyone, this is Pastor Apostolos. So wonderful to see you this Sunday. Well, we've spent the last five months on the book of Romans. Have you been enjoying this series? If you have, why not post a comment about how you've been encouraged by the book of Romans in the comment section below. I know I have personally gained so much from preparing these sermons. I feel that my Faith has been strengthened, and I'm more sure of God's love for me. But unfortunately, all good things must come to an end, because after today, we are going to be taking a break from the book of Romans. Of course, we have not finished the book yet. We are just at the midway point. But as I mentioned before, the book of Romans is the Mount Everest of all the books in the Bible. And chapter 8 is the peak, the summit of that mountain where you get to have the best lookout of all the wonderful benefits that we have in Jesus Christ. Now that is not to say that everything goes downhill from now on, but when you've worked hard to climb to the top of the mountain, you don't, you don't want to go straight back down, isn't it? You want to take a rest and enjoy the view a bit longer. So that is what we're going to do. We are going to stop at Romans chapter 8, take a moment to savour and digest what we have learnt, and then come back to finish the rest of the book at a later time. Now, whenever we get to the midpoint of a school term or course, what do we have? A midterm exam, isn't it? So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to have a midterm exam on the book of Romans. I can just picture some of you groaning when you heard the word exam. Most of us hate exams, isn't it? This is how one person put it. Exams are like girlfriends. Too many questions, difficult to understand. More explanation is needed. Result is always fail. <laughs> well, don't worry. You're not going to get a fail today. You won't be graded. So no stress, okay? But even though we hate exams, they are good for us because they help us to consolidate what we have learned and point out the weak areas that we need to work on. Well, here in the middle of the book of Romans, Paul gives us a midterm exam. He gives us a series of questions 
to test how well we have really grasped what he has been saying. These questions drive home the main point that he has been trying to make. So are you ready for the exam? Let us flip over the exam paper and turn to our Bible passage for today. Romans chapter 8 verses 31 to 39. So Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. And I'll be reading from the NIV version. How about you read along with me? What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If you have been following our series on the book of Romans, you may have observed that the Apostle Paul likes to use a lot of questions in his writings. In chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, for example, Paul gives a series of questions and answers. What advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? The answer? much in every way and then he goes on to explain why we see this also in chapters 6 and 7 where paul begins each section with a what shall we say then question look at chapter 6 verse 1 for example what shall we say then shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase the answer by no means we are those who have died to sin how can we live in it any longer Paul is employing here a popular teaching method used by ancient Greek philosophers known as a diatribe. A diatribe was an imaginary conversation between the speaker and an imaginary critic, whereby the speaker poses a series of questions and then answers them himself. Its purpose was to challenge assumptions, clarify ideas, defend the speaker from potential objections or false conclusions by his critics and help the listeners to really understand what the speaker is trying to say. Well, in today's passage, Paul gives us six more questions. And these six questions are probably the most important of all the questions in the book of Romans. Because through these six questions, Paul brings together everything he has taught in the first eight chapters and tests his readers to see how well they have really understood what it means for their life. Think of this as a midterm exam. All the other questions were just pop quizzes to prepare us for this exam. So are you ready to answer these six questions? Have you got a pen and a piece of paper ready? Let us look at the first question. The first question is in verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? In other words, how did you or how will you respond to what you have learned in the first eight chapters of Romans? This is an open-ended question, by the way, but to make it easier for you, I'm going to turn it into a multiple choice question. How did you respond to the book of Romans? Did you A, rejoice in God? Did you say, Amen, 
Amen. Thank you, God, for sending Jesus to save me. Or B, you agree to what Paul said, but it didn't really affect you in any way. Or C, you are indifferent. You can't see what's the big deal. Or D, you disagree with what Paul said. Or E, you are not sure. You like some of the things that Paul said, but you're not convinced whether it is really true or not. This is an important question because the Bible is not just any book that you read to get a university degree or job promotion. It is God's book. And your relationship with God hangs on how you respond to this book. What is important is not much it's not how much of it you know, but how much of it have you applied to your life. Have you ever sat in a class or a lecture and walked out thinking to yourself, so what? That was a lot of information, but I can't see how any of it is relevant to me. That's how many people read the Bible. They might find it interesting or entertaining, but so what? It's just a lot of facts and information to them, and they do nothing about it. It makes no impact on their life. What they read stays at the knowledge level without moving to the application level. Jada Packer wrote a great book that I would say is a must read for every Christian called Knowing God. In this book, he writes, Whenever we embark on any line of study in God's holy book, we need to ask ourselves, what is my ultimate aim and object in occupying my mind with these things? What do I intend to do with my knowledge about God once I've got it? For if we pursue theological knowledge for its own sake, it's bound to go bad on us. It will make us proud and conceited, for the very greatness of the subject matter will intoxicate us. In other words, to read the Bible without responding to it with faith and obedience is dangerous. James chapter 1 warns us, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. So every time we read the Bible, we must ask ourselves the question, how do the truths contained in it apply to my life? What is this passage telling me to do? Am I doing that? Am I responding to this passage in the way that the author wants me to? So how have you responded to what we have learned so far in the book of Romans? Has it led to some real concrete changes in your life? What have you done about it? With this first question then, the Apostle Paul wants us to internalize what we have learned and move us to action. Okay, ready for question two? The second question is found in the second half of verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? A. Nothing can oppose us. B. Some things can. C. Many things. Or D. All things. What's your answer? The answer should be pretty obvious, isn't it? This is a rhetorical question question? The answer is, of course, A. Nothing can come against us if God is for us. Actually, the if in this verse can probably be better translated since or because. Since God is for us, because of the fact that God is on our side, who can come against us? Imagine you are walking home from school one day, 
And along the way, a big bully appears in front of you on the street. It's that guy from school that everyone is afraid of. He's got this menacing look on his face. And then he starts to approach you, clenching his fists. And you go, "Uh uh-oh, I'm in real trouble here. That guy is much bigger than me and much faster. There's no way I can beat him in a fight or run away. But as you brace yourself for that first punch, something strange happens. The big bully backs off. His face turns pale and then he runs away off, scared. Surprised, you turn around to see what had scared off that bully. And there is your dad, Bruce Lee. With Bruce Lee as your dad, you don't have to be afraid of anyone, isn't it? No one is going to dare to attack you. Well, guess what? Did you know that the almighty God who created the heavens and the earth, the God God who flung the Milky Way and all other galaxies into existence, The God who governs and sustains all things with his infinite power and knowledge is your dad. God is for you. If you believe in Jesus, of course. If you don't believe in Jesus, the first three chapters of Romans have shown us that God's anger is upon you because of your sins. But at the cross, Jesus died for our sins. He absorbed God's anger against human sin for us. So if you believe in Jesus, your sins are forgiven and God's anger is turned away from you. God is no longer against you. He is for you. Not only that, he has adopted you as his child. He is no and not your school principal, he is your father. Now, of course, that is not to say that we will never experience any opposition in this life. Because many things do come against us, isn't it? People come against us, circumstances go against us, the devil goes against us, the world goes against us. But who cares if God is for us? Who cares who is against us? Is another way we could rephrase this question. In Psalm chapter 3, King David says, I will not fear though tens of thousands come against me on every side. Only a nutcase would say something like that. Or someone who has incredible confidence in the power of God to protect them. No matter how big or powerful the enemy was, King David was not afraid. Why? Because he knew that God had his back. A good example is the story of Gideon. With just 300 men, he managed to defeat an army of 135,000 Midianites. Realistically speaking, such a feat is impossible, isn't it? But one with God is a majority, as Martin Luther taught. If God is for you, it doesn't matter how strong the opposition may be or how many foes you are against. They are no match for you. Because if God is with you, one is greater than many. So what people or circumstances are against you right now? If you are a believer, know that God is for you and therefore nothing can come against you. This leads us to question 3 in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him Graciously give us, A, all things, B, most things, C, some things, or D, nothing. 
the answer once again should be pretty obvious, isn't it? This is a greater to lesser argument. Let me start with the greater. If God has already given us what is most precious to Him, His one and only Son, how will He not also give us all things? The rest is easy. D.L. Moody used this illustration. Imagine you walk into a jewelry store and the shopkeeper takes out his most expensive and valuable diamond and hands it to you and says, here, this is for you. And you go, wow, really? Thank you. And you take it. But then you realize that you have nothing to wrap that diamond with. Now, would you hesitate to ask that shopkeeper for some brown wrapping paper to wrap that diamond? Would you go, um, I'm not sure, I might be asking for a bit too much here. Of course not, right? He has just handed you his most expensive diamond. What is brown wrapping paper compared to that? Of course, he's going to give you brown wrapping paper. Well, that diamond is God giving you his one and only son. Everything else is just like brown wrapping paper in comparison. If God gave us what was most valuable to him, his one and only son, how much more will he give us all other things? But there have been many times where I've asked God for things where he didn't end up giving them to me, you may be thinking. Perhaps you have asked God for a particular job and you never uh, got that job. Or you asked God to heal someone, but that person did not get better. Or you asked God for a marriage partner, but you're still single. Does God really give us all things? Our experience suggests otherwise, isn't it? Well, that depends on what the Bible means by all things. Notice Paul doesn't say God will give us all things that we ask for. He says God will give us all things. And remember, where else that phrase all things pops up in chapter 8, in verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So the all things that Paul is talking about here is all things that are for our good. Because not all things are good for us. Sometimes God doesn't give us what we ask for because he knows that that thing is not good for us. We may think it's good, but God knows better. Because remember, what is the ultimate good that God has in mind for us? For us to be conformed into the image of his son, Jesus, is it not? That is the ultimate good. And God knows that if he was to give us everything that we ask for, it would actually lead us away from Jesus rather than make us more like him. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus asks, Which of you, if your son asks for a bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Like any good father, God does not withhold anything good from his children. If he doesn't uh, give it to us, it must not be that good for us in the first place. But one thing we can always count on. God always provides for his children. If you are his child, you will never be in lack because God will always give you all that you need. So what do you need at this moment? Is it a job? Do you need money to pay your bills? Do you need guidance? Do you need peace? Do you need healing? Whatever it is, why not 
ask God. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. So ask God and trust that He will take care of all your needs. He may not give you exactly what you ask for, but know that He always gives you what is best for you. Let's look at question 4 now. In verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? Paul is using language from the law court here. Who can file a charge against us, in other words? A. No one. B. People can. C. The devil. Or is it D. God. The answer is once again, A. No one. No one is able to bring a charge against us. Why? Because it is God who justifies us. God is the judge. God is the person who brings down the gavel and decides whether you are innocent or guilty. And if you believe in Jesus, God has already declared us to be innocent because of what Jesus has done for us at the cross. God has justified us. He treats us just as if I'd never sinned. If the judge has already declared us to be innocent, who has the right to accuse us? Even the devil, Satan, is not able to accuse us. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, Satan is described as someone who accuses God's people before God day and night. In fact, that is what his name Satan means. In Hebrew, Satan means the adversary or the accuser. Satan knows all our dirty, hidden secrets, all right? He knows all our failures, our weaknesses, our sins. And he keeps telling God, see, look at how terrible Apostolos is. How can you let him off, God? And he's right. I am a great sinner. Jesus is a great saviour. And God goes, give it up, Satan. The case already got closed when Apostolos put his faith in Jesus. The law has been satisfied and I have already declared him to be innocent because of what Jesus has done for him. And this leads us nicely to the fifth question. The fifth question is pretty much the same as the fourth question. Verse 34 says, Who then is the one who condemns? People may try to condemn us, all right? The devil tries to condemn us all the time. Sometimes our own hearts condemn us. But who has the right to condemn us? Once again, no one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Actually, this is a trick question because there is one person who has the right to condemn us. Do you know who that person is? Jesus Christ. Because Jesus was the only sinless person who ever lived and we put him to death. But does Jesus condemn us? No. Instead, he is at the right hand of the Father interceding on our behalf asking God to forgive our sins. Jesus is cheering us on. What an honour. How does that make you feel? How would you feel if, for example, after this uh, 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 service, you receive a phone call from someone saying, I just want to let you know that you've been on my mind and I've been praying for you every day. How would, how would that make you feel? You'd feel really good, right? Wow, you've been praying for me? I'm that important to you? If someone is praying for you all the time, you know that you must be very valuable to that person, right? That person must love you dearly. Well, guess what? That person is Jesus. 
Jesus is our number one prayer partner. Right now, yes, right now, He is at the Father's side, interceding on your behalf. On the night He was betrayed, Jesus said to Peter, Guess what, Peter? Satan has been asking me about you. He's asked to sift all of you like we. Now, if you were Peter, how would you react? If it was me, I'd be thinking, What'd you say, Jesus? What did Jesus say? He said, But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. Phew, that's reassuring. When we have Jesus as our defense attorney, all accusations against us come to nothing. So whenever you feel condemned, whether it be coming from other people or from the devil or even from yourself, remind yourself that if Jesus does not condemn you, then no one else can. Stand upon Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This brings us to the sixth question in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Have you noticed how each question, question is crescendoing up to a climax? Well, here we have the climax. If you think of the book of Romans as a grand staircase that takes us up into the love of God, then this sixth question is the top step. Who can separate us from the love of God? Paul then goes on to list seven possibilities, seven painful experiences that might cause people to think that God doesn't love them. Shall trouble or hardship or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, poverty, danger, and violence. These are the pressures of life that all people go through in this broken world of ours in one form or another, isn't it? Particularly if you are a Christian. But can any of these terrible experiences separate us from God's love? Paul gives the answer in verse 37. No, no. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. What does it mean to be more than a conqueror? Well, in the original language, the word literally means to win a most glorious victory. It has a ring of certainty to it. You see, when you are a conqueror, you still have to struggle and fight to achieve victory over your opponent, isn't it? But when you are more than a conqueror, you've won even before the fight has even started. Like the fall of Jericho. Joshua 6 recalls that the city of Jericho had huge big walls that were impenetrable. But with God's help, the Israelites were able to bring down those walls without even having to pick up a sword or build a siege weapon. All they did was march around the walls for six days, blowing some trumpets, and on the seventh day, the walls came crashing down on their own. That's more than a conqueror. But notice it is not we who conquer, but Christ who conquers for us. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. At the cross, Christ went through all the afflictions known to mankind. He was beaten, whipped, stripped naked, stabbed, mocked, humiliated, and tortured to death. But He triumphed over all these. And all we have to do is piggyback on the victory that Christ has already won for us at the cross. Nick Vujicic is someone who is more than a conqueror. Born without any arms or legs, I'd like to play a short video of his testimony.
Hi, my name is Nick Vujicic, and when I was born without arms and legs, my parents had no idea that their limbless boy would turn into the hands and feet of the love of Jesus Christ spread all around the world. As a child, I was bullied and I went to Sunday school and learned that Jesus loved me, that he had a hope plan in the future for me as well. Well, I'm like, what kind of plan is this? Can I suggest the plan B? So I prayed for arms and legs and they did not come. And when I didn't hear anything from heaven, I started doubting that he indeed had a plan for me. So I prayed for arms and legs, but what I realized what I needed more was heaven, peace, purpose, and forgiveness of my sin. At age 10, I tried to commit suicide because of the bullying predominantly at school. I didn't feel like I'd ever be independent and only a burden to my parents. I'd always be alone and never get married and never have a family and never find a purpose worth living for, hence a value worthy. So I tried to commit suicide at age 10 with six inches of bath water. I was stopped by one thought. And the thought was seeing my mum and my dad crying at my grave, wishing they could have done something more. At age 15, I gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ because I realized more than arms and legs, I wanted purpose and salvation and healing, forgiveness of my sins. I wanted Jesus. But I still didn't know why I was born this way. Well, in John chapter 9, everyone asked Jesus, why was that blind man born that way? Jesus said it was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him. What I realized, I was actually as blind as the blind man. We had no idea what God had in store. And just because you don't see what God has in store doesn't mean his store is empty. Kids come up and say, what happened? And I say, cigarettes. <laughs> Definitely as a child and a teenager, I'd never thought I'd be a speaker that would travel around the world and meet presidents and speak at congresses and be in stadiums as large as 110,000. I had no idea. And I just give God all the glory and all the praise for the people who pray for us, the people who support us and made this possible to travel around and preach the gospel to millions of souls. God loves me not because of what I can do or what I will do for the kingdom of God. He just loves me for me. When I put my little foot on my wife's womb as she was pregnant with our first son, uh, I felt him kick and I looked at my wife in her eyes and I said, babe, I love him. I never touched him, saw him, heard him laugh, see him smile. He never earned my love. That love was always there from the beginning, before he was even born. So be challenged today to know that God is not done with you yet. He wants to stretch you a little bit. And I dare you to believe in the greatness of our God because he has no limit. Wow, is that not an incredible story? The guy can even surf. I can't surf and I've got all four limbs intact. If you think you have it bad, just look at Nick Vujicic. At least you have arms and legs. And yet when you look at Nick in the video, he seems like he's the happiest guy on earth. Nick Vujicic is a great example of someone who was able to more than conquer all the troubles and hardships and adversities that life threw at him. How was he able to do that? Because he knew that God loved him. I like what he said at the end of the video. God loves me not because of what I can do or will do for the kingdom of God. He just loves me for me. He has no limits. God has no limits and his love has no limits either. In verses 38 to 40, Paul brings everything to a grand climax. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, Neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Here, Paul scours the universe for any possibility, for any possible circumstances that may be barriers to God's love. 
And notice how he pretty much covers all realms of existence. He begins with the physical realm. Can death or life separate us from the love of God? No. How about angels or demons? Is there anything in the spiritual realm that can separate us from God's love? Once again, no. How about the temporal realm? The present or the future? Again, no. Is there any power, physical, spiritual or any other kind, that can separate us from God's love? Again, no. How about the spatial realm? Can any height or depth be too far for God's love to reach us? Once again, no. Is there anything else in all creation then? Still, the answer is no. Paul has exhausted all the possibilities that he can think of. And still, he can't think of anything that can separate us from the love of God. In short, there is nothing that can separate us from God's love. Absolutely nothing. God's love has no limits. God does, uh, uh, Paul doesn't just know this to be true. He is convinced of it. I am convinced, Paul says, that there is nothing in this universe that can tear us apart from God's love. What does it mean to be convinced? It means that you are absolutely sure of it. Paul has no doubt whatsoever that nothing can separate him from God's love. So let me finish with one more final question. Paul doesn't ask this question explicitly, but I think it's pretty implicit behind everything he has been saying. This is the real question that Paul is posing to each and every one of us today. And that question is, how convinced are you of God's love for you? Time to bring everything you have learned uh, from a theoretical level to a personal level. It's time to test whether what Paul has been saying has really sunk deep into your heart. How convinced are you of God's love for you? Are you A, fully convinced, B, somewhat convinced, C, a little bit convinced, D, not sure, or E, not convinced at all? Well, let me rephrase this question in another way. Is there anything at all that could cause you to doubt God's love for you? Think about what is the worst possible thing that could happen to you. Perhaps the death of your child, or losing your job, or losing your home, or or your wealth, or getting into an accident that leaves you permanently paralyzed, or your spouse walking out on your marriage. I pray that none of these things will happen to you, but let's say they do happen. Would it make you to doubt God's love? If you belong to Jesus, know that nothing can separate you from God's love. There may be moments where you don't feel uh, that God loves you, but just because you don't feel God's love doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. Because God's love is not based on your feelings or your circumstances or what you have or haven't done. His love is based on His character, on His Word. And if God says nothing can separate you from His love, guess what? It means nothing can separate you from God's love. Even when you don't feel God's love or feel uh, you are lovable. It's just that in the midst of our pain, we are often too focused on the pain itself to see God's love behind it. In those painful moments, 
you need to trust in God's word that even in the midst of your pain, God has never stopped loving you. But what if you do not believe in Jesus? Well, God loves you too. John chapter 3 verse 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. The world here includes you, by the way. You may not love God, but God loves you. You may, want to have, uh, you may not want to have anything to do with God, but God wants all of you. You may be running away from God, but God will keep pursuing you until you come to Him. You might think that you are too much of a failure for God to love you, but God's love for you is not based on how good you are or how deserving you are. He loves you because He made you. He loved you from the moment you were born. He loves you exactly the way that you are. So much so that he was willing to sacrifice his one and only son for you. That is how precious you are to him. The real question is not whether anything can separate us from God's love, because we know that nothing can, but whether we will separate ourselves from God's love. The choice is ours. The ball is in our court. Will you receive God's love or will you reject it? How do you receive God's love? By believing in Jesus Christ. Notice how God makes his love known to us in Christ Jesus. Nothing is able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus Christ is the cord that binds us to God's love. So the question is, will you hold on to that love cord through faith? Or will you cut it? That is what it means to be in Christ. It means that you bind yourself to Christ through faith. So are you in Christ or are you out of Christ? Today, God is telling you, I have and I will always love you. How will you respond to his love? Will you bind yourself to Jesus and let his love cord secure you? Or will you reject Him and separate yourself from His love? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you so much for giving us the book of Romans. We thank you so much for all the amazing truths that we have learnt through it. We thank you that through the book of Romans, we have come to know of your amazing love for us. And we thank you that through today's passage, we are reminded of the fact that nothing can separate us from your love. So help us, Lord, to be convinced of this truth, especially in times of pain and suffering. May your Holy Spirit pour the love of God into our hearts today. And I pray particularly for those who may not know your love or can't feel your love at this moment. May your love touch them today. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
formal service for this morning. Uh, but once again, it doesn't stop there. God's love. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for your future? Post a message, share your thoughts, join a growth group. We'd love to hear from you. Um, until then, for those who'd like to continue supporting Grace and Truth, thank you so much for your prayers. And for those who'd like to continue supporting us through uh, financially, the details will be on the next page. Uh, remember, press subscribe, like, and we'll see you next week.